Hello and welcome to Stonehenge. My name is Chris and today we're going to be travelling back in time about 5,000 years to a time known as the Neolithic Age when our ancestors began work on one of the world's most iconic landmarks. Now the stones behind me weigh up to 35 tonnes and the people who put them there couldn't have done it on an empty stomach. Today we're going to be looking at the eating habits of the people that built Stonehenge, including amazing new evidence that our ancestors were making Neolithic cheese, and I'll be making more tasty discoveries later on. We're also going to be learning more about Stonehenge, as well as its lesser known sister site, Durrington Walls, which is about two miles away from here and had a really important role to play in the development of Stonehenge. Now, if you're watching this on Facebook, YouTube or Twitter, and you have a burning question about Stonehenge or prehistory in England, then please do get in touch. You can tweet using the hashtag SH underscore feast and our team of experts are standing by and ready to answer your questions during this live stream. But first, it's time to start at the beginning. Now, how on earth did this enormous monument get there? And no, it wasn't aliens. There are hundreds of myths and legends about the creation of Stonehenge, the most colorful of which involved the likes of giants, Merlin, and even aliens. Obviously, this is not the case. The truth is that Stonehenge is a masterpiece of human ingenuity. The first Stonehenge was a simple circular ditch dug with antler tools around 5,000 years ago. By around 2,500 BC, larger stones had been brought to the site, including giant sarsen stones from North Wiltshire, which could weigh as much as 30 tonnes. We're not entirely sure how the stones were transported, but it is thought that they were dragged on wooden rollers and loaded onto rafts where possible. Smaller blue stones were also brought to the site from Wales, a journey of over 250 kilometres. The stones were then worked into shape using hammer stones and erected using precisely interlocking joints, unseen at any other prehistoric monument. Ramps and counterweights were probably used to tip the upright stones into place and a platform and levers likely raised the lintels. To fit the upright stones with the horizontal lintels, mortise holes and protruding tenons were created. The lintels were slotted together using tongue and groove joints, usually only found in woodworking. Erecting these stones took as long as 50 years, and the entire development of the monument took even longer, up to 800 years in total. Our ingenious ancestors brought engineering to a monumental scale, and in the process, created the most iconic prehistoric structure in the world. So there you have it. Stonehenge wasn't built by giants or aliens, but rather about 5,000 years ago by human beings in an age we now refer to as the Neolithic. Hey, who are you calling thick? No, it's Neolithic. It's how we refer to your era of history. Hmm. Neolithic, eh? <laughs> so uh, what are you doing here today? What am I doing here? <laughs> This is my home. Oh, I see. <laughs> the cheek. Look, um, I presume you're here for the feast, yeah? Now, have you got any pigs with you? Yeah, no, sorry, I, no pigs, I'm afraid. <sighs> well, no pigs is no good, is it, eh? Had some chaps arrive yesterday, brought their pigs all the way down from northern Scotland. My goodness, that's a long way to come. No, no. What a bore! <laughs> it's so far away. <laughs> pig, pig joke. Anyway, look, we're gathering food for the feast. Come on. Give us a hand. Yeah, I'll, I'll come and see you in, uh, in, in, in your house over in, in a little bit. But before we do, let's find out more about Stonehenge and Durrington Walls. I'm delighted to be joined now by one of Britain's most eminent prehistorians, Mike Parker Pearson. Mike, thank you very much Hello. for joining me. Um, now, I've been hearing a lot about Durrington Walls, a site close to here. Could you tell me a little bit more about its significance in relation to Stonehenge? Well, when we excavated at Darrington Walls, what we found was a huge amount of domestic material, including the remains of houses. This is actually a reconstruction of one of them. And uh, when we were able to get radiocarbon dates, we discovered that it was occupied at the same time that the second stage, the main stage of Stonehenge, was actually built. So we think that this was probably where people were living when they built Stonehenge. Right, so this wasn't a typical Neolithic village. It was actually much larger, you think? Yes, uh, from the number of houses likely across the complex, uh, over a thousand houses maybe, potentially four to five thousand people live there. 
Wow. And what did Darrington Wars consist of? Mm. Well, it wasn't just houses, uh, uh, but we had timber circles. So Woodhenge is the most famous, but there were others within the centre of the complex. And then as the village came to an end, it was encircled by a huge uh, a circle of timbers. So, you know, this was a place where people had come probably very for a very short time. We know that it was less than 40 years, more likely somewhere around a decade, and many of them coming just for the winter seasons. Right. And were Darrington Walls and Stonehenge linked physically in any way? It's the River Avon that is the connector, because each of the complexes, Stonehenge and Darrington Walls, had a ceremonial avenue, each of them on a solstice alignment that led to the river. So we think that they were two halves of a single complex. Right. And does the archaeology and research from Darrington Walls suggest or give us any indication as to the meaning of Stonehenge or why it was built? Mm. Well, when we came to dig at Stonehenge, we discovered that actually it was full of burials. We had the cremated remains of some 60 people. That's just a small proportion of the hundreds that were likely to have been buried there. So I think what we realized was that these were intimately linked. One, a place of the living built out of timber, the other a place of the dead or the ancestors built out of stone, with the, the idea basically that they were building in stone to commemorate the permanence of the dead, of the ancestors, uh, uh, the, the eternal uh, side of, of, their, li of their, their deaths, whereas the timber structures were actually transient to do with the world of the living. So this was the key principle in Neolithic life. Fascinating. Well, thank you very much indeed, Mike. I think we're going to see you later on for a Q&A as well. And I don't know about you, but I'm just about ready for a bite to eat. Let's head over to the house over here and see what is cooking. There are some wonderful aromas. Let's check it out. Well, well, well. Ah. Look who decided to trot up, eh? <laughs> the funnily dressed bloke I was telling you about earlier. Come to give us a hand, have you? Actually, as opposed to helping you out, I was wondering if I could learn about some of the food that you're eating. Get a load of this guy, eh? First, he doesn't bring any pigs with him. Then he wants to learn about the food instead of making it. <laughs> Typical. <laughs> well, we're having a big old feast here, so there's plenty of pig to go around. Can't have a feast without pigs. Mm. That's not better. <laughs> <laughs> and we have hazelnuts, cherries, and a variety of berries. Can't have a feast without hazelnuts, cherries, and a variety of berries. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and over here, there's something rather special. And what's that? Cheese. Oh, you especially can't have a feast without cheese. Yes. <laughs> what is cheese? Well, what is cheese? Well, we can't digest milk, so we turn it into cheese. Yeah. Uh, and and it's and it and it's so delicious. <laughs> mm, there's no pig in cheese. Why didn't you say a cheese joke? Well, that's, cheese that's, joke. That's fascinating. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined now by Susan Greeny. Susan is a senior properties historian at English Heritage. Thank you very much for joining us, Susan. Um, there are some great food items on display here. Could you tell us a little bit more about the food types that people were eating when they were building Stonehenge? Well we know that they were feasting and the main thing they were eating was, was meat. Huge right. quantities of meat, both pork and, and um, beef. So cattle and pigs were both being killed on site. So we have masses and masses of pork particularly. But we also know that they were eating cheese. They were processing milk. In, and we found dairy products in the ceramics, in the grooveware pottery that they, we found on the site. So they were eating cheese, they were eating pork, they were eating beef. And they were also probably making things out of fruit and vegetables as well. But that evidence really doesn't survive for us archaeologists to find anymore. Sure. And how do we know what our ancestors were eating 5,000 years ago? So it's partly from the, the remains, so the food remains, so what was left over. So people were throwing away the bones, people were um, um, throwing away bits and pieces that they didn't eat. Um, but also we've been looking at the pots, so we've been doing something called cer ceramic residue analysis, which means we can look at what gets absorbed into the pots when they're used for cooking. And that tells us that they're making beef and pork stews, but they're also processing cheese. Right. It sounds like food is quite copious then. Were the people here, were they scraping by or was food in abundance? No, in this particular place, and this particular times of year, we know that people were probably feasting around midwinter particularly, they had huge amounts of food and they were being really wasteful actually. So people right. were perhaps bringing lots and lots of food together and having a big celebration. And can these feasting activities tell us about what Stonehenge was used for perhaps? 
Well, one of the really interesting things is that we know from the age of the pigs that are being killed that they're about nine months old, which suggests that they're killing them around midwinter. And at Stonehenge, we have an alignment with the solstice, with midwinter solstice. So it suggests that people are gathering here at that time of year to take part in feasts and to take part in ceremonies as well at, at Stonehenge and at some of the timber monuments near the houses. Right. Now, you mentioned that there were dairy fats found in some of the grooved ware pottery at Durrington Walls. What does that tell us? Well, it's really interesting because this evidence shows that people were not just using their animals for meat, but they're also milking their cows. At this time, people didn't um, have the right genes to be able to digest raw milk. So the adults, would, it would have made them ill. So what they were doing, we think, is processing this milk into something much more edible. So yogurt, cheese, butter. And that's quite a, a technology that we didn't actually think was around. Until we did this research, we, we didn't know that they were able to do this. So it's really exciting. Excellent. Now, I've heard a rumour that you might have had a go yourself at making some of this Neolithic cheese. We did, yeah. Shall we take a look? Yeah. Cheesy peasy! Today we're going to be trying to make some cheese and I've got Penny Bickle with me from York University. So what's the process? What do we need to do first? Well the first thing we need to do is heat up the milk. Okay. So we're going to pour the milk into the pot. Okay, so we've got some milk here. Now this is just more ordinary uh, modern milk isn't it from the supermarket but, but they would have presumably had sort of unpasteurised milk? Yes, uh, yeah straight from the cow. So we're going to just put this on the edge of the fire? Yeah. So this is the kind of grooveware pottery that we found in excavations at Durrington Walls. Um, how do we know that they were eating, drinking milk? What we do is we take a piece of the pottery and we clean up the surfaces and then we analyse the fats which have been absorbed into the walls of the pots themselves. When you get a pot like this has been used, this one actually has got a bit of black. You can see the residue on the inside. It's, yeah. not, it's not that residue you're testing, it's actually no. right within the clay no, of the pot. Yeah, it's really been absorbed into the clay okay. and preserved over the, the thousand years that the pot's been in the ground. So let's have a test of the, the milk and see how hot it's getting. Yes, that's getting warm enough. Now. Oh, cool. It's time to okay. add the rennet. Okay, I'm going to take the pot away from the fire now. Oh, it's oh, quite solid, great. isn't it? Yeah, it oh. really works. Okay, so what happens next? Well, now we need to strain the whey away from okay. the curd. So um, we're going to use this linen cloth and I think we'll put it over uh, this pot to catch the Okay, so if I hold in. that there. Yeah, so the pot is actually still quite warm. Okay. Um, but I'm going to use this spoon to scoop off so the you're going to ladle that into here, curds. yeah? Yeah. So, uh, what I'll do is I'll gather up the linen. Okay. And so that's the way draining off now. So we'll leave it like that, just suspended on the edge. And we'll come back in a couple of hours. So you can see that the whey has stopped draining out of the cloth now. Okay. So if I pop it into that little pot and undo the muslin. Ooh. It's going to be a little bit like cottage cheese. Oh, it looks just so... like cottage cheese. In fact, it looks nicer than cottage cheese. It looks like ricotta. <laughs> yeah, it does a bit, doesn't it? Should we try and taste a bit? Yeah, I think okay. so. Just take a little bit off. It's quite nice. It tastes very milky, doesn't it? it yeah, but it tastes milk. like ricotta. Yeah. Yeah. No. I could put that on pizza. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. Neolithic cheese. <laughs> so there you have it, Neolithic cheese. This live stream is getting feta and feta. Now I'm joined now by, now by some English heritage volunteers and some history experts from Shruton Primary School. Um, hi folks, thank you very much for joining us. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do here at Stonehenge? 
Hi, I'm a volunteer in these Neolithic huts, so we're showing people all the implements that they would have used at the same at the time of the building of the Stonehenge. Right. And have you guys seen some of the implements here today? What have you seen here at Stonehenge? Um, see, I can't remember now. Have you seen some? Uh -huh. Axe and arrows and a pot made out of clay. Very good. And what's been your favourite thing that you've seen? Um, the arrow. Excellent. Do they look quite dangerous? Yes. Very good. Um, now, there are some extraordinary things on display here today. Uh, would you like to talk us through what you have there? This is a scraper used for cleaning off fat and meat on skins. So they would use it and they would scrape it really hard. And this is a very special stone. Do you know what it is? Flint. Flint. Do you know why they used flint? It was sharp. sharp. It was really sharp. And look at this one here. That's a, a really sharp point. And that would be used for putting holes into the skin so that they could put a lace through it and maybe make shoes or a cloak to hold it together. Excellent. And I think we've got some examples of fibres as well, which are quite interesting. Would you like to talk yeah. us through these? these? These are nettle and flax and hemp. Feel how soft they are. Look at that. That's made of nettle. Would you like to wear nettles to school? No, because it might be uncomfortable. It might be, but it's amazing how soft they are, isn't it? Mm. Excellent stuff. Thank you very much, guys. Very nice to meet you. Now we're going to go through now and ask, find out a little bit more about the exhibition itself. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there's a brand new exhibition here at Stonehenge. So let's go and find out a little bit more about it. I'm joined now by Hannah Brown, who works for English Heritage. Hi, Hannah. Hi. Now, I understand you've had a hand in putting this exhibition together. Could you tell us a little bit more about it? Yes, so it's about uh, food and feasting at Durrington Walls, which was a village near Stonehenge. Um, and in the exhibition, we go into quite a lot of detail about the archaeological science that um, helps us to understand what people ate, um, how they were cooking it and where it came from. Great. So this new exhibition is housed at the Great Visitor Centre here at Stonehenge. Now, it's quite a new visitor centre for people who haven't been for a few years. Would you like to tell them a little bit more about it? Um, it opened in 2013. Um, it's got a really great um, number of objects, from uh, some of them from our local partner museums, like Salisbury Museum and Wiltshire Museum in Devizes. Um, and we also have this uh, audio-visual experience, and you can stand in the middle of it and imagine that you're in the middle of the stone circle, and it changes through it and shows you the different history and time periods of the stone circle. Excellent. And in the new exhibition itself, what will people be able to see? Well, we've got um, objects from the excavations at Durrington Walls, so lots of grief ware pots. Um, we've got lots of different bones, um, including a pig jaw, um, one of which has been sampled. Um, and the sampling from that pig jaw can tell us more about the isotope analysis. Um, we also have uh, a coprolite, which is uh, mineralised uh, poo. Great. Um, no, so, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Sorry. So worth, worth I wasn't going, sure where to go from there. Worth going just for that, really. <laughs> so thanks, Hannah. Thank you very much. Um, make sure you do visit Stonehenge. You can pre-book your tickets now. I think there's a link on the screen below. Now let's head back for the Feasting Hut, where I'm going to be joined by Mike and Susan to answer some of your questions. Now, firstly, Susan, uh, did Neolithic people eat chickens? Ah, oh, no, they didn't. Chickens didn't really arrive in the British Isles until the early Iron Age. And so in the Neolithic period, when Stonehenge was built, they probably could have eaten duck, maybe caught some wildfowl, so perhaps collected wild bird eggs, but they would definitely not have had chickens. Interesting. So no chickens. There we are. Uh, second question from Mike. Uh, what do the patterns on grooved ware pottery mean? Well, I wish we knew, but uh, <laughs> one, one of the very clear sort of uh, aspects of it is it does seem to be imitating basketry. So right. in one sense, it's, it's what we would call a skewer morph. Um, but it has unusual patterns sometimes, spirals. Again, those could be basketry related, but some people have wondered whether they might have had some more sort of magical significance right. to do with uh, uh, hallucination, hallucinatory states and so forth. Oh, wow. Uh, but I think one thing that is fairly clear is that actually this is an, an, uh, an island-wide style across the whole of Britain. So it's also, it would have been understood as something that actually linked people together from islands off the coast of Scotland all the way to the south coast of Britain. Gosh, that's fascinating. 
Uh, and Susan, next one for you. Now, did Neolithic people drink alcohol? Oh, that's a really good question. We don't know for sure. We haven't got direct evidence, but it's quite likely that they had the ability to make some sort of beer. They had cereal crops. They probably would have experimented with fermenting various things. And it's likely that they were drinking some form of alcohol, but we don't actually have the direct evidence for that. Of course, archaeology, a lot of organic things, they rot away. We don't always pick up even kind of evidence of fruit and vegetables. So um, finding evidence that would actually clinch the question about whether they were brewing beer or not is not something we've managed to do just yet. Haven't had a Neolithic brewery yet. Not yet. And uh, and final one for Mike. Did men and women have different roles in daily life? Mm. We don't actually know. Uh, we know from the, the period after this that in death men and women were kind of set in a opposite ways. So men lying on their left sides in the grave, women lying on their right sides. So there is a sense that it's a binary separation of the two. But for this period we don't have uh, that kind of segregation in the burials. Uh, what we do have is within the houses themselves where we get paired beds, one on either side like this, uh, we have found that the phosphorus, so this is one of the chemicals that we can pick up when we excavate, uh, that, that varies between beds. We found this at Darrington Walls, but we also know about this from northern Scotland at the same period. And it, it indicates that one of the beds has much higher values of phosphorus. And we think that's probably to do with small children and babies wetting the bed. And one possibility is that is that the, the, of the family, she would have spent more time with the small children on one bed and he presumably the luxury of not being stuck with the small kids on the other bed. But that's really all we can say. Interesting, very interesting. Well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for your questions on Twitter and thank you for Mike and Susan for joining us here today. Now, if you'd like to learn more about your Neolithic ancestors, the very best way to do that is to visit the new Feast exhibition here at Stonehenge. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to English Heritage on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter and Instagram. From all of us here at Stonehenge, thank you for watching and goodbye.